I want to talk to you uh, in the next few weeks about these three questions. And today, I want to start with, let me tell you, I'm Chris Bryan, the new senior pastor here. I'm glad that you're with us. Um, it makes a difference that you're here. And I pray at the end of the service, you feel the same way. And uh, you're like, man, I'm really glad I came. Um, so what we want to start today with the idea of what, uh, the question, why do people need Jesus? And um, as we go through some simple questions this week, next week, and the week after, uh, I'm going to do some Wesleyan or Methodist theology. Uh, uh, you're going to see more of my heart and who I am. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, I'm really hoping to help you answer these questions. Uh, some of you feel like you got a good answer already. Um, others are not so sure. Uh, but hopefully at the end of three weeks, you're going to feel really good about why we need Jesus and why we need his church and why we need this church. And so with that, um, let's go into the scripture today, and I want to read a passage from the Old Testament and then one in the New to tie things together about why you and I need Jesus. Okay, so we turn uh, from, to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 and then through 33, and we read, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant." Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And now from the gospel according to John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Truly, God's scripture given for we, God's people. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we do seek you this morning. Jesus, you promised that those who would seek would find, and those who knocked the door would be opened. Convince us this day by an outpouring of your spirit, not by lofty words or wisdom of this particular preacher, but rather truly from the power from on high. In Christ's name, amen. You know, at first it may sound offensive, and I would understand that, by saying everybody needs Jesus. But we Christians really believe that. Everybody needs Jesus. And I want you to hear it. Not just people who have yet to believe in him, not just people who have yet to ask for the gift of eternal life through him, not just those people that have never heard of him or were not blessed to grow up in a Christian household or a predominantly Christian culture. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs, not needed, needs present, perfect. Everybody needs Jesus, including and especially those of us who already claim his name. We need Jesus. As a matter of fact, the prize of Christianity is not heaven. It's Jesus. That's the prize of Christianity. Jesus himself. It's truly unfortunate the way the gospel has been presented to so many people who have accepted Christ, but not really accepted Jesus. They've, instead, they've, what they've accepted is what they think is the most important part about him. And that is essentially a personal, a personal escape plan in the event of their death. But friends, that's not the good news that changed the world. It's not the good news that will change the world. Instead, it's a shrink wrap, micro package for delivery version that makes Jesus into a mere consumer personal product. I've heard it described as fire insurance. And if that is all we think that Jesus does for us, it is no wonder that so many Christians live lives virtually indistinguishable from anyone else. We need Jesus, not just the eternal off, uh, life that's offered in his name. We need him. And if this seems new to you or a bit strange, or maybe you've never quite put it like that, you know, heard it put like that before, welcome to the United Methodist Church. Welcome to Wesleyan theology. Friends, this is what we believe. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said in uh, his, what is known as his 43rd out of the 44 doctrinal sermons, the standard sermons, and in this particular sermon called the scriptural way of salvation, he, he writes this, what is salvation? 
The salvation which is here spoken of is not what is frequently understood by that word, the going to heaven, eternal happiness. It is not a blessing which lies on the other side of death. It is a present thing, a blessing which through the free mercy of God, you are now in possession of. Salvation might be extended to the entire world of God from the first dawning of grace in the soul till it is consumed or consummated in glory in the life to come. Yeah, that's Jesus' spirituality. That's why we need Jesus. Jesus changes everything. He empowers, empowers, us, empowers us to not just be believers, but be people who are born of God. Children of God, children that act and look like the loving God in whose image we are already made. We need Jesus, not just what we think we can get through him. Jesus himself is the rock and the center of our faith. We need the good news about Jesus, and we need the good news of Jesus. We need the story about him and all that we believe about him, and we need the message that he himself taught and demonstrated. And without that holistic message, when that holistic message is reduced to a personal get out of hell free card, then all the vital transformative aspects of the Christian faith are ignored or denied. It's like overcooked vegetables. What's the use of eating them? All the nutrients are already boiled out. Listen, Jesus' spirituality is not, I'm saved from hell. Jesus' spirituality is, I know and love and serve God. And I love my neighbor. And the spirit of Jesus compels me to grow in both more and more. That's Jesus' spirituality. In Jesus, we are not offered fire insurance. We are offered genuine assurance. Assurance that God is love. That God loves us. That the Holy Spirit might bear witness with our own spirit. Yes, in fact, I am a child of God. Yes, in Jesus, we learn about and become participants of the kingdom of God. That's what he came preaching, the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. He said it's at, it's at hand. It's all around us. It's happening. A kingdom that has no end, no limits, no boundaries, and that our, even our own death wouldn't separate, it, separate us from it. And that's something that we need to no longer be afraid, to no longer be afraid, but be reassured that God loves us. God forgives us that God's presence is with us. And when people really receive that, not just believe it mentally, but receive it for themselves, that God really is love, that God really has forgiven me, even me, really loves me and is with me, friends, people change. When we let God love us all the way down to who we really are, not just to the acceptable parts. Listen, the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, that Jesus came preaching and teaching and demonstrating. It was the kingdom that he himself inaugurated in, a, in his own death, that he became the king of, receiving the crown of thorns and lifted up high on the throne of the cross, and then vindicated in his resurrection, overcoming death itself. Jesus, now the ruler of all. That kingdom is nothing short of complete and total new reality, a new God-fashioned reality. In the words of the apostle Paul, God is making all things new. I have to ask you, is that what your religion is about? Your practice of your faith, is that what it's about? Is that what your spirituality is about? I'm new here. I don't know a lot of people. I'm getting to know you. But in a church this size, I can guarantee you that there are people in this room who, despite how young they are, have gone through terrible things. And they are here today, and when they sing those wonderful songs, you know, it's less about emotion in the moment or whether they feel it or not, and it's more about the fact that they know they need Jesus because of what they've been through. Like, and it's hard to believe because they're so young, but basically they're like, no, I need Jesus today. I'm not waiting. <laughs> and there's older folks in this congregation. I guarantee you, older folks that have a gentle smile you know, gentle spilled about them, you know, you would never know. But if you peeled back the layers and you discovered the terrible things that they've lived through and they're in worship and you ask them, they're not waiting to die. They need Jesus today. They're in worship because they need Jesus today. You know, it's like, I, I think I said this in the very first sermon with you. One guy shared in his testimony with me. He said, you never really know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you got left. 
Or, or like the expression goes in the recovery movement, religion is lived by people afraid of hell. Spirituality is lived by people who've been through it. Friends, I want to step back for just a minute. Because sometimes I think the reason people get the wrong idea, the reason why we jump so quickly and, and, and in, even maybe inadvertently turn Jesus into a personal consumer product, is that we kind of forget what the mission was about. And we get all into what we get out of the deal. And we forget that, wait a minute, Jesus came revealing God. Jesus came to show us the God that had always been. The God that, that parts of it we had gotten right, but parts weren't so right. And he talked about scripture and he reinterpreted scripture and he was demonstrating, he wasn't inventing a new God, he was demonstrating and revealing the God that, that was. Christians are people who in Jesus' name are worshipers of this God. They're people who are being born through Jesus to this God, are, are the community of this, this God. I will be their God, and they will be my people, declares the Lord. This statement is found at least a dozen times in Scripture. Ten in the Old Testament, uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah quote it the most, I think, Isaiah at least once. And then in the New Testament, Paul uses this phrase in 2 Corinthians, and, and then you, hear it, you read it again in, in Hebrews. And, and I want you to look at that phrase, I will be their God, and they will be my people, declares the Lord. Look, look. Let's just contemplate that for a second. This is about the activity of God upon individuals for the sake of the community. That's about as far away from self-centered spirituality with nothing but personal benefits that you can get. This is the mission. This is what God's up to. To have a people for his own. God's mission has always been one of creating community. And I'll say more about this next week. Uh, on why people need the Jesus's church. But for now, you know, the missio Dei, the mission of God, it, it, missio Dei in Latin, the mission of God is, it, it, God's always been about creating a, a special relationship with a small group of people. And through that relationship, declaring, revealing God's own self to the world. For wherever God is revealed, that place is renewed. Wherever God is revealed for who God is, that place is renewed in the goodness of the intended original creation, starting with the human soul. Now, usually when people try to explain why um, we need Jesus, people start with John 3, 16 or something like, and that's, that's fine, you know, although I would recommend that you also include John 3, 17. I think it'll be more helpful to you. Uh, and there's often a lot, a lot of times conversation about uh, sin and Redemption, maybe heaven and hell, this sort of thing. And, and I think a lot of times we're, we're jumping so far ahead and, and jumping right into what might be understood as personal benefits that we don't, we need to back up for just a little bit and, and realize, look, the people we're talking to, they may not even or believe in God. Maybe there's times we struggle with whether or not we even believe in God. And, and, and we kind of get the cart before the horse. And, and we need to remember that part of the reason we can have confidence in, in God is Jesus, that part of what we recognize in his life and in his teachings and what he said and obviously his death and resurrection, that, that it's pointing to, a, to God, to a particular kind of God. Jesus helps us see God to understand what God is like and how God is at work in the world. In other words, if you can for a moment, pause and try to forget about Jesus. Just imagine right now a world without Jesus without any of the stories about him, without any of his teachings, without any of the miracles, without any of the demonstrations of who he was, and certainly without his death and resurrection. Just imagine, do you still believe in God? Why? Not to say that I'm encouraging you not to. I'm just saying Jesus is a huge part of why we are the way we are and what we do and what we think. How confident would you be without the Jesus story that God exists in a world with evil and tragedy. We Christians say, look, we get the best picture we'll ever get of God in Jesus of Nazareth. In him, we see what God is like and what God is up to and how God works in the world. If you ask a Christian, what God do you worship? You say, the one Jesus is talking about. <laughs> we know and see God in Jesus. In, in Jesus, God is revealed. In Jesus, God is received. In Jesus, we become God's people. Or let me say it a little differently. So many people assume beliefs today. 
And I'm always kind of shocked by it. People who are not really practicing any particular faith or they're really not professing to follow Jesus Christ. And they'll talk about God as love. And my background in all my education in history and religion and philosophy, I'm like, why do you think God is love? Like people just assume it. And I, I mean, I think God is love, but I have reasons for believing that. Because if you look back in the history of time, that's just not true. I mean, people just don't naturally think about it in these terms. But people they just assume, they assume that God is personally known. known. And I'm, that's mind-blowing because Christians revolutionized the world by this belief in a Holy Spirit. I mean, the, the Greco-Roman world, were, I mean, they weren't all that. It was interesting to talk about this person that was raised from the dead. But what shocked things and caused the revolution was the belief that God was personally knowable, that God would dwell within through this Jesus of Nazareth. That's what turned everything upside down. And of course, let's talk about afterlife for a second. Why would you believe in an afterlife? Let alone one that looks like the life herein, only better. Why? How, how would you believe in any of that stuff without Jesus? These are unique Christian concepts based on what we've come to believe about God through his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. We believe and, and hope in the goodness, not just rightness, but the goodness will ultimately triumph over evil because Jesus was raised from the dead. What narrative could possibly replace that? Can you imagine a world without the Easter message? How could we possibly come up with anything close to motivating us to believe that despite the tragedy and evil and death that we face in this world, that these things would not be the end, that somehow they would not have the last word, only Jesus allows us such confidence. Now, to be completely transparent, I would say that if the master himself were able to speak directly to us today, he would say, <clears throat> Chris, um, I think people can see everywhere everything that I revealed. God is every look, look, look. And he'd point out to the creation and the grace that's in creation. And he'd, he would point out indivi you know, like individual experiences of the spirit and, the, you know, and, and then point to the scriptures that were of his time and say, see, see, see. And, and if, I think what we would do at that point, we'd say, yes, but thanks for pointing that out to us because we can't do that on our own. We need you, Jesus. You help us see God. You help us understand the character and the nature of God. Jesus reveals, reveals God and helps us receive God and demonstrates our perfect response. We say as Christians, he is the invisible God made visible. He is the eternal word of God made into flesh. He is the way and the truth and the life. He is the clearest, fullest picture of God we'll ever get, both the clearest picture of who God is and the human response, both in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, the quest is exponentially more difficult and we might seek after God and seek to know God as we do in Jesus Christ, but it becomes so much more tough. People need Jesus because in him, he illuminates the God journey, makes it possible. In him, we receive God, whether we're 40 years into the journey or whether today we're contemplating taking our first step, asking, is there really a God? Jesus helps us with the journey. Jesus helps us recognize fully how great our need is for God and how fully great God is to meet that need. In Jesus, we see the teacher. In Jesus, we see the Savior. In Jesus, we see the King. And in seeing it, we realize maybe for the first time our great need to have these things. In Jesus, we hear clearly the voice of what up until then has been but an echo in our lives, inklings, uh, instincts that, that we sense within us, longings about the world in which we live. You and I know something's wrong, something's broken. I mean, we can feel it and it's absurd to deny it. In this world, innocent people 
get convicted and guilty people are let off and bullies find a way out of trouble and and victims spend the rest of their life coping with sorrow and hurt and bitterness and, and we long for and spend gobs of money and energy on lasting relationships and yet nearly always we find them difficult to maintain. Marriages made in heaven sometimes end not far from hell. Countries invade other countries and get away with it. We say that money and power are not good things to strive for and yet the only example of sin that is actually seems punishable is not having enough money and power. And so we dream of a world that would be different, where things would work out, where society would function fairly and efficiently, where we would not only know what we ought to do, but actually do it. And Christians say, Jesus shows us the way. Jesus gives us the picture of what that would actually look like. And he invites us not only to believe in such a vision, but to help make it so. Through him and by his spirit, he calls this vision the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God. And by his story, and most importantly, by his spirit among us, he confronts us in our own part to why the world is the way it is, how we have contributed to how bad things are, and then to our relief through his suffering and his death. He offers to us, God through him offers to us forgiveness that we might be reassured and take confidence that we are loved anyway. Even the worst parts of us are loved by God and forgiven. We're offered mercy and new life. And then the resurrected Lord of Lords commands us, challenging us, go and sin no more. Love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who would spitefully use you. Be peacemakers and truth tellers and grace givers. Be generous with your lives. Be those who would hunger and thirst for righteousness. Defend the poor, the widow, the orphan. Offer up your humanity to those who are your enemies. And in your selflessness and self-sacrifice, they will be humbled and some of them will even change. The days are coming, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and in their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. Other religions, we Christians say, offer in part what we feel we have in whole in Jesus. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. People need Jesus because in Jesus, God is revealed God is received, and we're changed into God's own people. I was reminded recently of a story I heard a long time ago, and you may have heard another preacher use this at some point, and if you have, you won't mind me using it again. It's a good story. A Christian in South China had a rice field in the middle of a hill. In the time of a drought, he used a water wheel worked by a treadmill to lift the water from down low up to high, a higher area where his fields were. He had a neighbor who had two fields below his. One night after he'd pumped the water into his own fields, his neighbor made a breach in the dividing bank so that the water he had pumped into his fields drained into the neighbor's. The next day, the Christian went out and repaired the breach and once again filled up his fields with water. Yet, a few days later, when the lower fields need watering again, his neighbor simply made a breach in the wall and let the water drain into his own fields. This happened three or four times until the Christian finally approached his neighbor and said to him, I've tried to be as patient with you as possible and not retaliate, but, but is it right what you are doing? But then after praying about that conversation and the neighbor's response, the Christian decided, you know, if I'm only seeking personal justice for me, I'm not really being as fully a follower of Jesus as I should be. And so when the time came for watering the next opportunity, He first watered his neighbor's fields, and then he watered his own. And two things happened after that. He never had to worry about repairing the breach again. And in time, his neighbor became a Christian. That's Jesus' spirituality. That's why the world needs Jesus. Because in Jesus, God is revealed. In Jesus, God is received. In Jesus, we become God's own people And the world becomes truly good as it was called by our creator and intends to be remade in the image of Jesus, conformed to that image by the power of the spirit, both character and conduct. Jesus called it being salt of the earth and light of the world, a city on a hill. How would you answer the question? Why do you need Jesus? One person I know and respect simply says this. He says, uh, Jesus makes me less of a jerk. 
It's not as sophisticated as the sermon today, but it's a good start. Yeah. What would you say? The most comprehensive, theologically sound, and concise answer I can give you, I've said it four or five times, in Jesus, God is revealed, God is received, and we become God's own people, changed into the people of God God wants us to be. And you know what? Yeah, that that makes me less of a jerk. In fact, in Jesus, when I listen to him, and I surrender more and more to him, I find myself being compelled to become the best version of myself. I feel within me a new power source for living that helps me accomplish or move towards that goal in a way that I couldn't do on my own. In fact, I've I've discovered that the more I get into Jesus, the more he tends to come out of me. And that gives me hope. It gives me hope for my life. It gives me hope for wherever his people are. What would you say? Why do you need Jesus?